All right. So here we go. This is the second sort of discussion post the book, Social and Communal Harmony. So now we're actually into some suttas that I enjoy and that I think might be helpful to you. There's no particular uh, order or system um, by which I'm choosing these suttas at the moment. And I'd like to keep it that way, to keep it a little bit alive and maybe to draw on some threads that we discussed last week, perhaps, that could follow on to this week, hopefully. But uh, hopefully each will also be a standalone opportunity to just delve into a particular aspect of the Dhamma. And um, because this is a discussion group rather than a sutta class, um, so far I'm choosing some fairly brief suttas because there's quite a lot in them. And if we get through one, that's fine, we can go to the next. Um, and today I'm choosing a sutta from the Salayatana Samyutta. And that is the um, section of the Samyutta Nikaya, which is this mighty big, wonderful treasure trove of Dhamma by the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. Again, he's the translator. And it's in the section on the six sense bases. So that's what Salayatana means, the uh, sense bases. And there are uh, six of them. So that includes the mind. And one of the reasons I thought this went uh, followed on really well from last week's sutta is that last week we spoke from the Vedana Samyutta and we spoke about um, Vedana or feeling or if you like the hedonic tone of experience. In other words, that aspect of experience that's pleasant, painful or somewhere in between. And we spoke about those feelings as being like winds that move through the sky, different kinds of winds, now blowing this way, now blowing that. And this was very much connected to the idea of Vedana feelings being impermanent, being something that in a sense are like visitors to this body and mind, you know, not something that we can actually hold on to or claim to be who we are or what we take ourselves to be. And um, the sense bases are related to feeling very closely. And this is explained in the Paticca Samuppada, the um, condition process of dependent arising, if you like, like the way this whole mass of suffering uh, arises and conditions the next and the next and the next phenomena in the sequence. And so in the Paticca Samuppada, uh, there's this very important link between feeling and craving, yeah, from feeling, which can be pleasant, painful, or somewhere in between we tend to react with craving, with aversion, or we generate um, more delusion, more ignorance when we don't really know what's going on. But before that, before that, the thing that gives rise to feeling is contact. Yeah, we can't feel unless we come in contact with the world as we know it. And that world is um, summarized as the six senses. So it's really whenever one of these senses comes in contact with its respective object. So for example, the eye coming in contact with forms, visual forms, that there's contact and as a result of that sense consciousness. So seeing the sense of seeing and as a result of that feeling that arises. So we're going a little bit further back in that causal sequence today and looking at that point of contact and why this is so important for our practice. And perhaps we can discuss how we can work with this. I'm sure that um, all of you can recognize how we get pulled around by the senses in our daily life and how what we see, smell, taste, touch and think about can cause a lot of suffering for us and for other people too, right? Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about this from the context of somebody who um, still has work to do in this field, which is presumably all of us. Okay, so um, somebody's saying the screen's not very clear. Is that the case for everybody or is it okay? Yeah, there's not much we can do about that, to be honest. That's the dukkha of your eye consciousness right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unpleasant sights. Well, maybe it's pleasant if it's not very clear. We've uh, I just adjusted the angle. Maybe that helps. So uh, luckily, the Dharma can be heard with ears. This is one very good use of the ears. 
So this is on page 1206 in the Samyutta Nikaya. I don't know if, how many people might actually have it, but even if you don't, it doesn't really matter because the Dhamma... Oh, Benjamin just held up a copy, I think. Yes! Mm. Great! Aww. I'm happy for you. That is wonderful. Are you trying to unmute or say something? With thanks to Gunter. Bless you, Gunter. That is so kind. That's real Kalyanamitta. So Gunter gave him the book between last week and now. Oh, that makes me so happy. <laughs> That's really beautiful. The gift of Dhamma is the highest gift. So I hope you feel happy about that, Gunter. Mm. Oh, that's heartwarming, actually. All right, now I just have to enjoy that feeling. <laughs> oh, okay, so this is on page 1206 and it's called Devadaha. So Devadaha here is a place. So here we go. And again, for anyone who has or hasn't um, been here before, please feel free to write any comments, questions, um, complaint, Sergeant Brown would say in the chat, <laughs> or raise your hand at any point if you want to say something, and uh, I'll come to you at some opportune time. And also I'm inviting the people in the room with me here mm. to do the same. So they'll raise their hands, their real hands, and I'll come to you whenever uh, there's a suitable time. Okay. So hopefully you can hear people here as well. All right. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling among the Sakyans, where there was a town of the Sakyans named Devadaha. There, the Blessed One addressed the monastics thus. So I've changed bhikkhus to monastics to be a little bit more inclusive, but this can relate to any practitioner. It means somebody who's practicing. Monastics, I do not say of all monastics or all practitioners, that they still have work to do with diligence in regard to the six bases for contact. Nor do I say of all monastics or practitioners that they do not have work to do with diligence in regard to the six bases for contact. I do not say of those people who are adahants, whose taints are destroyed, who have lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached their own goal, utterly destroyed the fetters of existence and are completely liberated through final knowledge that they still have work to do with diligence in regard to the six bases for contact. In other words, they finish their work in that field. Why is that? They have done their work with diligence. They're, they are incapable of being negligent. So this is what we're aspiring to here. But I say of those bhikkhus or those people who are trainees, who have not attained their mind's ideal, who dwell aspiring for the unsurpassed security from bondage, that they still have work to do with diligence in regard to the six bases for contact. Why is that? There are monastics or practitioners, forms cognizable by the eye that are agreeable and those that are disagreeable. One should train so that these do not persist obsessing one's mind, even when they're repeatedly experienced. When the mind is not obsessed, tireless energy is aroused, unmuddled mindfulness is set up, the body becomes tranquil and untroubled, the mind becomes, uh oh, Ajahn Brahm's least favorite word, it says concentrated here, but it really means, I'm pretty sure the word will be samahitam or something like that, samadhi, when the mind attains to samadhi, in other words, when it becomes still, and one-pointed. 
Seeing this fruit of diligence, monastics, I say that those people still have work to do with diligence in regard to the six bases for contact. Perhaps I'll keep reading through this little sutta to the end and we'll go back afterwards. There are bhikkhus or monastics, sounds cognizable by the ear, and now they've put dot, dot, dot. So what would the next one be? Forms cognizable by the eye, sight, sound, usually. Smells cognizable by the nose. Tastes cognizable by the tongue. Um, tangibles cognizable by the body, is that right? Mm. And mental phenomena, I suppose, or dhammas cognizable by the mind. Oh yes, it says that. Mental phenomena cognizable by the mind that are agreeable and those that are disagreeable. One should train so that these do not persist obsessing one's mind, even when they're repeatedly experienced. When the mind is not obsessed, tireless energy is aroused. Unmodeled mindfulness is set up. The body becomes tranquil and untroubled. The mind becomes stilled and one-pointed. Seeing this fruit of diligence, bhikkhus or monastics or practitioners, I say that those people still have work to do with diligence in regard to the six bases for contact. Okay, so this is quite a deep sutta and perhaps quite dense in the sense that there's a lot to unpick here. And uh, the first question should be easy. How many of you fall into the first category? How many fall into the second? <laughs> I can say I fall into the second, okay. So there's still work to do with regard to these six sense bases or six bases for contact. So, um, yeah. Are there any terms, perhaps, first of all, that may be confusing for anybody before we start to um, go into it in detail? Is that easy to understand, at least at page value? Any confusion at all? Yeah. So I find this quite interesting because we're first of all being shown the ideal, right? One of the aims in a sense of the holy life, one of the aims of practice, which is not to have any negligence, to be diligent in regard to these six bases for contact. Yeah? So what do you think that means? And I guess there's a clue here, right? These are arahats whose taints are destroyed, who've lived the holy life. In other words, um, reach the end of the spiritual path, eliminated suffering, uprooted suffering from their whole being. I don't want to say hearts, even being is wrong, but uprooted suffering, let's say. And uh, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached their own goal, utterly destroyed the fetters of existence and are completely liberated through final knowledge. Hmm? So this is simply by observing these six sense bases. So this is our aim, and it's one of the ways of, um, of uh, understanding what the goal of practice is. Of course, we can also say that uh, the goal of practice is to understand the impermanent, non-self and suffering nature of the five aggregates, the five components of existence, yeah? body and mind in another way, divided up in another way. Um, I'm going to come to Suzanne because you have up your hand. Uh, just see if anything needs clarifying or is any questions so far? Yeah, clarifying. Um, so uh, a person who is an ar arahant, who is fully liberated, still has work to do? Question mark. Like, like I, I um. So so they still have to work on on these six uh, um, sense um, senses to be careful about them to. Hmm. Is there like could could they lose the the state of an arhant if right. they don't, or what is meant by that? 
Yeah. Well, it actually says here that he does not say, the Buddha does not say of those people who are arahats that they still have work to do. Oh, okay. So it's probably yeah. just, um, yeah. Oh, I'll read it again. Yeah, mm -hmm. like you probably didn't quite follow it because there's quite a lot in between those two phrases. I do not say of those because who are arahats, and then it goes into the definition. I do of not life. say. Oh. I do not say that they still okay. have work to do. Oh, okay. And this then he says, of... why is that? That they have done their work with diligence, that okay. they're capable of being negligent. Okay. So it's a very positive message in the sense that once we've actually done that work, yeah um it's not that they wouldn't be diligent anymore and it, but they would actually be incapable of being ne negligent so in a sense that diligence would be a default state yeah they would naturally be diligent because yeah it's not that they would not see hear smell taste or touch but those things the way i understand it is that those contacts would not obsess the mind anymore and they wouldn't lead to unwholesome states so for for ordinary people, you know, they um, they impact us. You know, any any sight, sound, smell, taste, taste and touch us to some extent impact impact us, and also the way we think about those things impacts us very much and can lead to uh, unwholesome states of mind, right? Because especially if we're not mindful, but for somebody who's established mindfulness and who has actually uprooted craving and aversion completely then there would be still the same sights, the same sounds. But, you mm -hmm. know, one of the suttas in the Pali Canon, it actually says in the seeing, only the seeing, in the hearing, only the hearing. And it's offered as an instruction, but it's also a description of how um, people would regard those senses mm -hmm. without that sense of self, without that reactivity and craving. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I'm, just I'm really, consciousness. I'm relieved that I just, didn't hear it right because I was like, oh, God, it doesn't stop being hard. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right, right. But it's interesting because the bit that I missed the first time I read it, I missed for myself, is that the Buddha's then talking about people who are trainees. And that usually relates to people who are actually stream winners or above, so are not mm. really enlightened yet. And for them too, they do have to still dwell diligently in regard to these six senses so even there we have to be uh, diligent you know until that diligence and is perfected yeah mm -hmm. yeah well that i i have for my for my own experience i i have i've had states where i was really still my mind was so still i just noticed there's a, a sensation or some kind of that, that it's just what it is and there's no craving for it it's mm -hmm. It's such a different, it's very different than when I'm in a, you know, state of, I don't know, all day life mind uh, and I'm just in it, you know, and I, I kind of, I understand what it's meant by that, that it's, it, it's, if I don't cling on it, I don't do anything with it. It's, it's just what it is. And right. I make, a, I make uh, something with it and that's the problem. So, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I can. Uh, be lost in it and I can be you know when I had very deep meditation I can be free from it mm. so it can change still yeah. for me right 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 yeah. absolutely but at least we're getting a sense of mm -hmm. where the reactivity comes from and how by that diligent mindfulness we can kind of nip something in the bud so that it doesn't kind of carry us away to the point mm -hmm. where we're basically confused about what triggered yeah. this whole thing in the first place right yeah so that's great that's great yeah yeah i'm coming to shirley now and then i'll come perhaps i should just quickly come to the box actually shirley do you mind because there's a question related to understanding the the words in the sutta so i'll just come to the comment in the box first um maybe you want to answer something whoops concentrated and one-pointed is it is it samadified or are they two different things? Um, we'd have to look at the Pali to know what it's referring to, whether one pointed was a kagata and concentrated was samadhi. Um, I think it's two different words, yeah. It's two different words, absolutely, because the Buddha wouldn't use both if it was the same thing. But I don't know if um, what you're asking is, are they two different things? Ah, uh, samadhi. Well, is is samadhi is concentrated different from one pointed? Well, one pointedness is one of the 
qualities of samadhi. Um, so uh, samadhi has many other qualities like being uh, piti, sukha, so many other uh, the five factors of samadhi. One, huh? vitaka vichara. Thank you, vitaka vichara, piti, sukha, ekagata. So ekag one pointed is one of the five qualities of samadhi, but obviously one of the important ones. Right, but there we're talking about jhana, the first jhana specifically, where those five qualities come yeah, into play. That's yeah, yeah. specific to the first jhana. But I think it's interesting that because here it's not really defining how deep this samadhi is, but it's interesting to me that samadhi and ekagata go together because it's just making it clear that it really does mean a kind of unification of the mind. In other words, the mind is immersed in its object there's a unity there mm. because i know that in you know a lot of the teachings of so-called jhanas <laughs> in some uh um what would we say um it's not really a tradition but the way it's sometimes taught is mm. that um you know one pointedness is not necessarily a part of samadhi but actually the very definition of samadhi really means that there's no duality anymore, that the mind is unified, that the diversity of perception is, um, has dropped away and the mind is just settled and stilled within itself. So I think it's just to sort of intensify what it really means by samadhi in this case. So, yeah, like you said, it's an aspect, isn't it? Um, I'll just go through some other points on the that word, I was going to ask for a reminder of what one pointed means. So hopefully that has explained it to you, like that the mind is basically immersed in one object. Hmm? So it's become one in a sense with that object. The Pali word used is samahita, which can be translated exactly yeah, as settled, composed, attentive, collected. Hmm. It can be translated that way. It can also be translated as stilled which is very beautiful. Yeah, mm -hmm. because settled, attentive is a little bit loose, I would say attentive, we can be attentive without being actually completely still. I mean, attention is actually just one of the um, factors of Nama, the, one of the factors of the mind. So it doesn't necessarily equate to Samadhi. Um, compose, yes, definitely it'd be in a composure and it'll be settled, it'll be collected. Yeah. The root is samadhi. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Samahita means it has become one. samadhied, <laughs> settled, stilled, composed, etc., serene and unified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'm coming to Shirley now. Hello. Hello. Yes, all that uh, sort of talk about deep concentration is sort of. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, 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 I'm, I'm on a different track because although I've been a, I've been a Buddhist for decades, I still looking at this. I still feel I'm, a, I'm an absolute beginner. Uh, but what appeals to me, I, I, I this is a sort of reflection, but it's also a question because I may have got it totally wrong. But my reflection is that this is a real gradual process. Yes. And we actually start off this. What comforts me is this obsessing of the mind, yeah. this proliferation, this chewing it all over when we've got with something that we don't like has happened mm -hmm. or something that we really like and rejoicing has happened. We chew it over, we attach to it, we proliferate, we make yeah. a big, big thing of it, we take it all personally. And I think I'm beginning to stop doing that. I think mm -hmm. that's probably as far as I've got. But I did have this um, sort of insight recently over my tendency to grumpiness and irritability and just being generally, you know. Uh, and I just thought, well, this is just stuff coming this is just stuff around you know i used to beat myself up and think oh, i've got to overcome these negative states i mean this is far down far around the wheel of petitra samapada from 
you know you've got into the you've got into the um craving and the upper dana by that and this is what and this is when it starts to hurt mm, and, yeah and this is is becomes very obvious when you're on the buddhist path when you're actually having these negative feelings and then i realized I had this insight that it wasn't something I'd got to overcome or get rid of because I just I didn't invite them in. I didn't ask to be grumpy. I didn't ask to be irritated. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, I'm actually missing out on beautiful states. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. kindness towards them mm -hmm. arose. Mm -hmm. And from that, a sense of because I'm really quite a scatter. Well, you know, you've, you've, you've had me live with you for a week. You know, I'm a bit sort of scattered and all over the place sometimes. Um, so I'm not the sort of composed, mindful, concentrated person. But this, when I had this insight, I had this vigilant. I wanted to be vigilant. I wanted to keep, I wasn't watching the sense bases. I was watching the my reactions to them and realizing yeah. i could just let them dissolve good, 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 good. um so then when you really start working on that then there's the uh what does it say yeah. there's, then there's the tireless energy you want to be energetic you want to be vigilant over yeah. the mind and then the um you know, hopefully you'll get a bit of a muddled mindfulness if you're me, because yeah. I mean, my mindfulness is pretty muddled a lot of the time. And then you might even get some tranquility. And, you know, yes, I have had times when I've been tranquil and oh, the mind really? been calm. You can watch it come and go. But in real life, for many of us, I guess yeah. I'm not the only one. This doesn't always happen. Um, so I suppose that's my... So to actually start at guarding the sense yes. basis, I think... I've always found that a bit of a challenge. So I suppose my challenge is, is actually just working with the yeah. general grumpiness and, and, and irritability mm -hmm. that I think probably does come up from time to time with most of us. So mm -hmm. that's my reflection in Thank case you. it helps anybody. Fabulous. And also my question in case um, I need you know, you've got any advice about whether that's a good way to work or whether yeah. how I should, you know, how I should uh, hone my practice, as it were. So that's what came out of me for that sort of. But for me, it was it was an invitation to sort of start at the very beginning, yes. sort of gradually work work your way onwards. That's how I saw it too, actually, as a gradual training and a gradual process and something that we can start wherever we're at, you know. And it's not that somebody's got to this stage or someone else has got to that. It's that we're all at different points on that sequence at different times in our practice, you know. I mean, I do know you a bit, Shirley, and what you've said about yourself is a little bit on the hard <laughs> side, honestly. <laughs> And I know that you can enjoy some peaceful meditation and, you know, experience the senses really quiet. And, and so, you know, we mustn't lose sight of that. But I do think that for most of us in our daily life, no matter what point we're at, and remember this is for trainees, as in stream winners, once returners, maybe even non-returners as well, to continue working on in daily life. And I think this is a big piece of practice that's often uh, overlooked and neglected. One of the things that um, I asked uh, Jambra Amanda Jambramali about once, I think, was, uh, you know, at what point in the gradual training are we actually ready to meditate? And they said it's when those impressions of the senses do not obsess the mind. So in some other suttas, it says when the hindrances do not obsess the mind, which is the same thing, essentially, right? You know, because it's not just the impression, it's the reactivity to it. So it's when they're not obsessing the mind. You know, we don't have to have a completely quiet mind to begin with. But the um, proliferation and the kind of something coming back again and again and again and being played over and <laughs> intensifying is very exhausting. And this is one of the reasons, you know, that we won't get very far in our meditation, if that's the case. So, um yeah, I think we can work at the level of accepting these things. Um, but also, I think it's important to notice what's causing it in the first place. And I, I think this is one of the invitations here is to start to um, trace back our reactivity to 
the actual contact. And I guess sense restraint does go hand in hand with mindfulness. Like in the gradual training, they're kind of interconnected. They're, that's one of Ajahn Brahm's least favorite words. <laughs> they go kind of, they mutually reinforce each other, you know, because we have to have a certain amount of mindfulness to know um, how a certain sense impression is affecting our mind and, and the reaction that can lead to. Um, but we also have to have a certain amount of sense restraint to not tire ourselves out to the point that we can't be mindful, if you like. <laughs> so I think, yeah, it's a huge field of practice and one that's very rich to explore in daily life. But if they're not obsessing our mind, then we have a chance to actually start to meditate, right? And develop that energy and mindfulness on the cushion, which will then encourage sense restraint. I mean, once you've got a modicum of peacefulness, the last thing you want to do is go out and start kind of looking at everything and filling your mind up with unwholesome, say, TV or, you know, lots and lots of music, etc. because you start to value the peace. As you said, you know, valuing the, um, the quiet that can come from actually letting those senses calm down is another way to, um, to guard the senses. We just start to be more inclined inward than outward over time. Anyone else want to comment on that? Because that was quite rich. Just been, I've been using this, um, I don't know if you um, watch animal shows, like uh, nature shows, how uh, when, um, let's say, um, um, an, an animal is protecting their child from like a wolf attack or something. They use their whole body. And sometimes like the, the, the adult animals will sort of surround the small calf to, with their bodies mm -hmm. to protect it. And so I've been really finding it really lovely to think about sense restraint um, in terms of the metta sutta, the Karnina metta sutta, where it talks about how even as a mother would protect with her life, her, her child, her only child. So I've just been bringing up this image of having like these buffalo surrounding this, this very young, weak and tender calf mm. and having um, sort of that same attitude around protecting the, the senses, like really protecting mm. the heart from the, from the attack of the, the yeah, great. It's been really, really nice practice with it. Yeah, 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 that's lovely. That's sort of where the practice gets creative, isn't it? Did everyone hear that okay? Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Simile or image, if you like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, often it's about our relationship with the senses, isn't it? You know, and I think, like Shirley said, the acceptance, the making peace with the... You know, having a bit of compassion for oneself is another part of um, establishing a wholesome relationship as opposed to being um, drawn in with craving and aversion. Yeah. It protects the mind. Sanayana. Hi, um, Thank Hi. you. Uh, I had a um, small question. So, um, so um so the the two cases is um a person's a arhant or a person's a trainee right um but <laughs> is it is it correct is my um understanding correct that a trainee is usually uh referred to somebody who at least has like a right view yeah um yeah. and um and so is does that mean the um so uh, the fact that um, uh, to to attend to like the um, um, six, uh, you know, to the um, senses and the contact, would a person would um, at least have to have right view in order to like attend to this correctly? Um, That's a really good question. Um, 
I don't think that it's that we first have to have right view, because if that were the case, we wouldn't be able to begin in the practice. But I would imagine that the right view would give us a very clear understanding of the suffering involved in those senses. It would become much clearer that these things are actually burning. For example, one of the um, suttas in this Salayatana Samyutta is the discourse on burning. And that's where the Buddha says the five senses, the six senses are burning, burning with craving, burning with aversion, burning with delusion, and also burning with old age, sickness, death, uh, sorrow, lamentation, and pain, grief, and despair. So a trainee would understand this, and I think that would give a lot more um, impetus to the practice. You know, a lot more, um, it's like realizing your turban's on fire. That's another sutta somewhere in the, uh, in the Pali Canon. I've no idea where, but one should practice as though their turban is on fire. It would give you that sense of urgency, you know, to really do your best to guard the senses because you realize what a danger it is to start to roll in, in um, craving and aversion. But it doesn't mean they'll be free from that, so they still have to do the work. But I think it would give that sense of urgency and um uh it, it's like all the factors of the path will be stronger because right view is stronger so the sequent you know the subsequent factors will also be stronger but still have to be developed so i think the training is the same for all you know it, it would be the same teaching whether somebody's um a stream winner or not because this is exactly what's found in the gradual training which is aimed more at people who are still you know, practicing for, for the stages of enlightenment. So, but I think, you know, there'd be less likelihood of getting obsessed for a long time. But I find it encouraging to know that it can still happen, even to those people, you know, so we're not as far away as we might think. I mean, if we already see the danger in getting embroiled and um, reacting to these things, and, uh, you know, recognizing that energy can be aroused at times, and at other times, it's not then uh, we're working properly. Yeah, we're working properly. But it's, uh, yeah. I mean, the other thing that could be different also for a stream winner, and not necessarily, it depends on, you know, how you read the suttas, but they're much more likely to be able to get into deep states of samadhi. So they're more likely to have another source of happiness that's purer, Mm -hmm. and more refined and something to contrast with, you know, the pleasure of the senses. So a lot of the work for people pre jhana or, you know, who aren't having a lot of experience of deep meditation, a lot of the time is to see the danger in the senses, see the suffering in those senses and compare it to whatever peace we do experience in our practice, you know, to really make that clear to the mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there's something in the chat. Uh, let me have a look. Uh, this talks about awakening factors. It's wonderful to all these suttas get linked. It's wonderful that all these suttas get linked. Correct. I mean, the Dhamma is, uh, you know, it's like taking a bite of cake from a different part of the cake. <laughs> It's connected to the whole cake, right? <laughs> One piece might look different or have different kind of icing or something, but it's actually still part of the same cake. So yeah, it all gets connected. Absolutely. So the enlightenment factors that we can find in this sutta are things like the mindfulness in the, in, uh, the seven factors of awakening. That's actually the first factor of uh, enlightenment. And then the um, Dhamma Vichaya comes next, which is um, learning to discern and um, dissect experience. So in a sense, that could include understanding what's wholesome and unwholesome, you know, using the wisdom faculty. And then that would lead to energy, right? That would lead to energy. From the energy, you would then get PT. PT is not directly mentioned here, but it goes to tranquility, the body being tranquil, first of all, and then to the mind being let's say the mind having samadhi <laughs> yeah it's difficult isn't it when they translate becomes concentrated what can you say becomes samahita <laughs> becomes uh still and unified so yeah that would obviously include the happiness as a proximate cause for that stillness yeah yeah 
there's a question in the chat which I have not yet answered, so I'll come to that as well. Uh, do you want to do this? Does the mind sense? Does the mind sense or mental phenomena refer to thoughts, memories, fantasizing, worry, ruminating, reactions to feelings, emotions, etc.? Um, I think the mind sense probably in this uh, sutta refers to the mind itself, the pure the mind um, as consciousness, possibly, while as Thoughts, memories, fantasizing, worrying, ruminating. That's, um, I think it's as one of the six bases for contact. contact. It's still, it would include all of that, mm. I think. One of the six bases of contact. Yeah. Mind and mental objects. Yeah. I know. Maybe. I think it includes that. I mean, in the sense of um, the mind becoming still, then the mind has obviously uh, divested itself from all of those mm. phenomena and it's just attained to one-pointedness, which is precisely why it's one-pointed, right? Because it no longer has the thoughts, memories, fantasizing, worry, mm. etc. But I would say they're all part of the sixth sense. The mind as a sense. Mind consciousness is aware of mental objects, which can include anything. It can also include the beautiful objects as well, right? So yes, it might, it doesn't necessarily refer to those things, but it includes them. And it also includes um, things like inspiration, things like happiness, whatever the mind can be conscious of. But a lot of the time it's the mind, if you really look at what it's doing, it's just thinking about the five sense exactly, world. Exactly, exactly. And thoughts about the five sense yeah. world. But yeah, it includes thoughts, memories, yeah. fantasies, worries about that five sense world. Yeah. So I actually mm -hmm. think it isn't the pure mind, whatever's supposed to be the pure mind. I actually would refute that idea altogether. I mean, consciousness. Um, and Yeah, mind consciousness is conscious of something. It's conscious of all of this. I don't, mm. know. I don't know why. I just remember once um, Ajahn Brown saying all this thoughts, proliferation, fantasizing, worrying is about the five sense world. We're like obsessed about the five sense world. But it's the mind that's obsessed. And um, he said, it's, you drop that and then you, you are with the mind. Um, that's in yeah. Samadhi. Yeah, I think yeah. he's referring, That's to, he's referring to Samadhi. But as a sense Samadhi. base, as a sense base, mm. it's very clearly about the mental yeah. objects. Yeah, it's about yeah. the five yeah, sense I mean, world. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's what is included in in mind. Yeah, mental phenomena. The mind comes in contact anything that's mental, basically. Yeah. Um, I'll come to Liz. And then we can come to Jeff. In the chat. It's, a, it's a bit of a uh, call for help there because the senses, the physical senses, I am, I think, maybe blowing my own trumpet there, but quite aware of and the effects they have on the mind. But then the mind sneaks up on me. It, it is it's easy to uh, smell something and be aware, oh, when I smell that, look what's going on, you know. But the ideas, the worries, uh, they sneak up. They, they're yeah. not as easy. Have you got a little tip? Sorry, I don't. Have you got any tip to, 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 ah, to deal with Ah, about working with the mind. Sneaking up. Mm -hmm. about working with the mind objects yeah 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 i mean i think this is the main challenge in sense restraint is actually re restraining the mind i think this is the yeah. most difficult part you know because the eye i mean it sees things and we might like or dislike that but it's really what the mind does with that that's <laughs> that's even more suffering isn't it you know the fact that those things are replayed over and over and over again in the mind so I mean, one of the ways that I work with that is by um, reframing the way I view those things. 
So, for example, an obvious um, example, an area that we all probably struggle is with human relationships. Somebody said something or did something that we think meant something that maybe it didn't, right? And we go back and create this whole image of that person based on something they said, which we think they meant. We, we think we know what they meant by it, but we've actually got it wrong. <laughs> and then we, um, we create a lot of suffering and we keep on remembering that look or that word or that lack of praise or whatever it might be. And for me, um, I mean, one way is to come back to the body because body con consciousness, you know, the, the tangible feelings in the body are an immediate way to bring ourselves into the present moment and also to work with any unpleasant emotion that's arisen in a much more tangible way, in a concrete rather than abstract way, you know, and it can, it can actually um, get us out of the thinking mind. That's one way. But sometimes it can also be helpful to um, learn to think differently about a situation. So to actually reframe the situation and to just, um, I mean, I really love the phrase, give the person the benefit of the doubt. It doesn't mean you um, rationalize bad behavior that's obviously, you know, hurtful or, or whatever, but it can mean, you know, questioning your perception or judgment of a situation and maybe trying to understand things from their perspective a little bit more. And another way I think that can be, I was saying this at lunchtime today, and I don't know if this really comes into sense restraint or not, but I think if something's really playing on my mind and causing a lot of proliferation and anxiety and a feeling like, oh, I'm not valued, this can come up for me. <laughs> or I'm kind of, you know, seen as the bad nun because I'm always asking people what to do. <laughs> I will not see you like that. <laughs> no, no, because you don't live with me. <laughs> uh, just wait till October, I might come and visit you. <laughs> But um, the point being that, you know, sometimes it's good to talk to a person. It's good to clarify one's perception or, you know, uh, insecurity and just to be vulnerable about it and say, oh, sometimes I feel a bit sad because I feel kind of, you know, like, I don't know, people don't relate to me in a natural way because of my position in the monastery or whatever it is, you know, and just ask a person is this what they meant by that comment they should say no not at all i'm just trying to look out for you or you know something like this so i mean that's a more active way to work but i actually think that could be really helpful if we get in if we're starting to get ourselves into a hole <laughs> yeah. and also yeah. to you know to do what they say in the suttas which is to have thoughts of loving kindness towards our companions in public and in private which suggests that we should actually be doing something when we're alone we should be uh, using our mind to generate thoughts of loving kindness of gratitude of appreciation for the people we're around you know deliberately bringing up their good qualities for example before we can see mm -hmm. as their faults you know it's like come on you know of course they have some good qualities like remember this remember that you so know i used to say to my students you know look try to find something good to say about this person yeah sometimes they look at me completely lost i said well i'll do the first bit they breathe and they used to look at me and start laughing and then and they breathe <laughs> okay <laughs> and then that would start them off you know uh, being more relaxed about it you know they breathe okay and now, what else? <laughs> oh, you know, that's actually really lovely and straight from the suttas, right? All beings, all beings that breathe. This is how it starts. Sabbe sata, sabbe pana. The way we begin the metta sutta, like the metta chanting in Burma anyway, is like all beings, all breathing beings. Because we breathe oh, wow. exactly that. We're human, we feel, we breathe, we suffer, we hurt, you know. There's even a rock song, isn't there, about everybody hurts sometimes? <laughs> Yeah, I can't remember who it's from, but yes, uh, I could even sing it. But I could sing it, but I better not. <laughs> exactly what I think. I will restrain <laughs> myself. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah.
yeah. But this is so important, you know, this is an aspect of right view is to see the universality in our human condition. And I think this is one aspect of right view that we often forget. We think it's about, oh, I have to understand suffering. That means I have to understand my suffering. That's not what it means. It means we have to understand that there is suffering and suffering is universal, that there is a cause of suffering and the cause of suffering is universal. And there's a way out which is universal and otherwise anyone can. It's just a matter of cert putting certain conditions in place. And um, then we start depersonalizing this whole process. And if somebody's being mean, it's like, well, maybe they haven't heard the teachings of the Buddha. Maybe they haven't got wise companions. Maybe they've been watching some depressing news or they've received bad news or, you know, we have to, that's what I mean by giving the benefit of the doubt. We just don't know. We just don't know what a person's going through or where they're coming from or what their struggles are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, no one can understand what it's like to be kind of starting the bikini sangha in a country which doesn't even accept bikinis or is not friendly to them, you know. It's not a country, it's certain sangha, right, or, or just that it's not known to people. I mean, it's a non-Buddhist country. And what's involved there, I mean, nobody can actually know that. And I've had to understand that because for mm -hmm. me, you know, one of the most supportive things for me is when somebody says, I understand. And actually, I'm in a position where very few people can say that. And I've had to give myself that understanding. It's like, well, if somebody's saying this or that or not getting it, well, of course they're not because they're not in this position. It's not mm -hmm. that they don't have empathy or compassion, but I have to understand because I know my experience. So that can mm -hmm. be good too, I think, to, mm -hmm. not to be so thrown around by people's judgments or, yeah. What they think of us. I'm going to come to Sean now, and there's a lot. Thank you. Oh, no, actually, sorry. Thanks, Liz. Thanks a lot. I'm going to come to Jeff first, Sean, if you don't mind, because it's been there a while in the chat. Do you want to? Uh, when the mind is not obsessed, tireless energy is aroused. Unmuddled mindfulness is set up. The body becomes tranquil and untroubled. The mind becomes concentrated and one pointed. It also works the other way around. Exercising the body can make the mind tranquil and untroubled. Yay! I think that's what's missing in monastic life. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. We actually had a conversation the other day. We were both feeling a bit, um, what would you say? Uh, stuck. Yeah, sort of stuck. And uh, we said goodbye to someone. Yeah, in the evening. And then we looked at each other. Come on, let's go. And we went out of the gate like renegade nuns. And we kind of slightly jogged down the road. And it was quite funny. We thought, gosh, if someone could see us leaving the gate and running away like that, they think, wow, what's going on in this monastery? <laughs> but anyway, it was this very quiet lane, so we can do it. And I think there shouldn't be anything against that. And um, and yeah, mm -hmm. sometimes there's a build up, isn't there, of um, just stuck energy, mm -hmm. really, or lots of thinking if you've been at a computer screen. And exercise is so important. Yeah, you can release because the mind and the body are so interrelated, you can release a lot of stress that way. And um, it does make the mind tranquil and untroubled, but it won't go all the way. Yeah? It won't mm -hmm. go all the way because unless you um, have learned to use your mind in skillful ways, you'll find that unresolved issues from the day will quickly intrude and may even obsess the mind. So we do have to do our, our mental work as well and just learn to think in skillful ways. Yeah. We can also be aware of and obsessed with ideas, opinions, etc. not just the five senses. Absolutely, it's the five senses and the mind's ideas mm -hmm. and objects as part of it. It's just interesting to notice that most of them, including, I, in fact, to be honest, Shirley, mm -hmm. all our ideas and opinions are about the five sense world, <laughs> aren't they? Unless they're about the Dhamma. <laughs> if you think about it, there's not much outside that world. It can be, yeah, it can be ideas that come in the mind that are abstract, I guess, abstract things. But opinions are usually opinions of someone mm. or something that we've seen, heard, smelled, taste or touched. Mm. <laughs> it's quite astonishing when we realise that is our world, right? Unless we've experienced the world beyond the five senses, that's all we know, pretty much. Huh. All right, I'm coming to Sean. And then to the chat again. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, no, I was just going to say that 
you know, this sort of really resonates with me because two reasons. I have a slight obsessive tendency um, and also just sort of seeing it here and knowing that it's maybe more common than you realise of the mind. Like sometimes I'm much more aware of it now. Like I realise I keep thinking the same thought and it might not even be a positive one, you know, and it really drags you down. And then secondly, the how exhausting that is, because I actually suffer from chronic fatigue syndrome. So there are times when my energy is really low and, you know, I really suffer for that. Um, but it's all interlinked. And yeah. I just, yeah, so I just thought I'd raise that and share that um, because, you know, hearing other people talk always helps me as well. Um, and also just going to ask, I think you've really just covered it because I found those things you were just saying about, those reminders about the good thoughts and public and private and all those things and seeing it from a different perspective but is there anything sort of more specifically about the obsessive mind that you think um or maybe being embodied in you know your physical body to try and let go of that or maybe it's just part of the path you know you need just more patience i don't know right yeah um <laughs> I'm tempted to say exercise again, honestly, <laughs> unless you're really so exhausted, you can't do that. I sometimes think, especially if it's happening in the meditation and you can't stop it and it's going down a certain track, it's good to actually just open your eyes, take a breath, stop, do something else, distraction, in other words, just to cut it for a while. Because if you just continue down that track, it can be really hard to get out of the groove. So I think sometimes that's okay. And I think sometimes I've sat with that kind of obsessive mind for too long, just observing. Mm. But the danger with that is you think you're being mindful, but you're feeding it. Something in you is feeding it. If it's not stopping, mm. there's something there that's feeding it. I mean, a subtler way to work is to just look at your relationship to that obsessive mind. And quite often you notice that there's a feeding going on and feeding doesn't mean you want it necessarily it might mean a resistance it might mean a kind of i'm observing you but <laughs> and as soon as you can kind of soften to that and actually put some compassion in there in the relationship and be a little bit more gentle and get in touch with that feeling i mean for me compassion arises from just recognizing this hurts you know this is actually painful noticing that those obsessive thoughts do tire the body and mind and actually having a response of compassion towards yourself can be really really helpful and for me that's kind of imbued in the way that i'm aware and it's a certain softening like a certain relaxing energetically towards what's going on that can be really helpful and what else? I mean, if you're just thinking a lot, you can be a little bit more firm with yourself sometimes and just change your thoughts to thoughts of loving kindness. Even though it seems a little bit forced at first, it can work. I found that to work. How about you? Any other ideas? Well, my mom suggested three deep breaths today. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that's that. Sorry, I missed that. Three deep breaths. Not three deep breaths. Yeah. This. into your belly mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> my mom was talking about getting up with panic attacks since she was in her 40s and she's still there she's 75 you know and um yeah sometimes she just has takes three deep breaths you can do 15 minutes of it actually I mean, it's a breathing method, right? But it works and it resets the nervous system. And she, she uh, said, such, like, um, sometimes once the ball has started rolling, it, you, you can only wait for the, you can't do anything about it. It's already too late. You can only wait for it to end. If you catch it right at the beginning, great. But sometimes all you, you can't, it's just, it's just done its thing. So don't try and stop it. <laughs> I found it really helpful for a way to bring in metta with uh, those obsessive thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, maybe to think about 
the universality of that phenomenon mm -hmm. and how, you know, in my heart, I would wish anybody who's undergoing mm -hmm. this kind of barrage of thoughts or anyone who's feeling this right now, anywhere in the universe, yeah. may they be completely free mm -hmm. and lifted up and, you know, may they have a friend to help them get through it or whatever. Yeah, that's really so, nice. Um, yeah, okay. relate to others. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It also helps to embrace it, doesn't it? Because then you feel that there's a purpose to it in the yeah. sense that you can then understand how that is generally yeah. for others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's really great. Um, there's a couple of comments in the chat that I want to go to, and then I'll come to Suzanne. And I think that will probably be the last question for today, actually, because uh, or comment, because, gosh, mm -hmm. it's amazing how fast this time goes. I feel like we've hardly started. I feel like there's so much more. I made a few notes. I haven't said any of it. But anyway, this is not about us. <laughs> sure, we could do this for longer. All right. A legend about the creation of Chinese martial arts says they came from Bodhidharma teaching yoga to the monks because they spent so much, <laughs> too much time sitting and were unfit. <laughs> yes, I would not be at all surprised. And I actually think it's a responsibility we have to our donors to look after our bodies. Otherwise, you're going to be lumped with a whole lot of medical bills for us when we're old or even before we're old, whatever old might mean, we're going to age prematurely if we just sit on our bottom all day. So, yeah, yeah. I used to be well sitting on my bum all day until I realized that there was very little gut motility and that now my esophagus, all the diaphragm is so weak that the esophagus, is, stomach's come above the diaphragm like a hair call hernia. You don't want this. This is from sitting a lot and just, you know, the muscle tone wearing out and... It isn't good. Mm. Yes, mm. the conceit of health sometimes mm. means that we don't actually take the care we need for the body. We think, I can transcend this body with the power of my mind. <laughs> but unfortunately, the body has other ideas. So, or fortunately, if you want to learn compassion. Sometimes I count prime numbers <laughs> with the exhalations to ease racy or obsessive thoughts. Depends on the momentum, but it usually helps me. Very good, yeah. Yeah, also, it can be a skillful way. I would just say that with any of these methods, for example, what I also mentioned earlier about replacing the thoughts with thoughts of loving kindness and also adding numbers maybe to the exhalations or you can do it to both. Um, just to be aware not to use too much tension, don't use too much force. Just try it gently and see if it might gently nudge the mind. But if it becomes like a battle with the mind, then maybe just back off a little bit. Sometimes the mind really is relieved to find some metaphrases to hang on to. Sometimes, yeah, the numbers can, can help to bring your mind back to the breath. But other times the tension can creep in and you can be getting into a battle without knowing it. So uh, yeah, just see what happened, what helps at any given time. Great tips, great tips. And hello, mm -hmm. Filippo, mm -hmm. nice to see you there. <laughs> Hi. Okay, coming mm -hmm. to Suzanne and maybe we'll end here soon. Hi. Thank you. Um... Yeah, first of all, my heart goes out to Sean about what he shared. I just feel with him, you know, with chronic fatigue syndrome, it's, I'm, it's really difficult to, to you know, live with that. And I wish you all the best mm -hmm. to, uh, yeah, just um, stay compassionate and, and uh, patient with yourself. Yeah. And the other thing, uh, what Jeff was writing, you know, about, uh, the other way around with the body, exercising the body makes the mind tranquil. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to me because, you know, at the time of the Buddha in India, there was really no, no like, you know, Hatha Yoga uh, started like a thousand years later in India. And at the time of the Buddha, there was all these schools that were teaching meditation. You know, there was no Hatha Yoga, I think. That's what I learned. And so I was I was always, in, in, in Hatha Yoga, the, in the scriptures, it says, you know, if you if you practice yoga, which is a, yoga is about calming the mind, making the mind still there, to, so the thoughts stop. But if you cannot do that, then you do hatha yoga. You know, then you you do uh, these exercises for the body to calm the mind. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, like the humanity kind of changed because of the time of the Buddha, people maybe didn't need that because they were more, they weren't so tense. They weren't so, so like, I don't know, um, mm-hmm. they were more calm. Maybe they didn't need to <laughs> exercises and, you know, to, 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 to release the tension in the body, because that really the effect is if you release the tensions in the body, thoughts become less. That's really my experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was, it was funny because you said, um, oh, we, we don't have that in monastic life. And it's such an old tradition, you know, uh, what you live, the Buddhist tradition. And and kind of in India, they they, they later on, they, you know, they d- develop different methods to calm the mind. And, um, and I'm wondering if we're living in a different age right now, you know, where it's just more difficult to just sit and become yeah. still. Well, and that is a point, actually, because I wouldn't say that people were so different. I think it's a common belief that people in the Buddha's day were so different. But actually, when you read some of the stories in the Vinaya and you read about people who were scallywags and didn't really get anywhere in the meditation, even with a Buddha around, and there were so many wars and there were so many kind of um horrible violences and things that would happen in those societies a lot of um you know prejudices discrimination to the lower castes etc etc i don't think people were that different but they did have the buddha and they did have his direct teachings and so of course in the sangha there was a very beautiful training laid down that included sense restraint and it actually included exercise by default because they lived as arms mendicants so they would walk for their daily meal and they would walk for miles and miles you know sometimes hundreds of miles to uh between one place and another even thousands to go and meet the buddha so yeah shirley said the same in the chat um but yeah i don't know if anywhere in the in the early suttas there's any comment about hatha yoga as such um mm. we're talking about ashtanga yoga here like actual ashtanga which is the eight limbs of yoga but in yoga they also do include in those eight limbs um yama and niyama which is like the do's and don'ts so they Mm. still have ethics they still have morality and um i guess it's more to do with modern monastic life especially in the west where we don't really walk on arms we don't live outside because it's cold um and also yeah for the lay people and for us to be honest our whole lives a lot of our lives are on computers they're very much more sedentary we get a whole lot more input you know coming at us at lightning speed than I'm sure was there in the Buddha's day. Um, Mm -hmm. So in that sense, yeah, I do think um, it's very helpful to have a kind of transition from, you know, maybe a busy or maybe a sedentary life during the day to maybe your evening meditation and sometimes some stretching, some yoga, a jog or some sort of exercise can be a really helpful way to just uh, transition between the two. Yeah, yeah, well, I think so. Rig Veda over 5,000 years ago mentioned yoga, it seems. When were the Patanjali's yoga suttas? I can't remember. I think that was, that was uh, around the time of the Buddha, a little bit later. So it was so. after, yeah. So but yeah. I was talking about Hatha yoga, and that is uh, the 6th century is the first time maybe it started, or the 15th century. They're not clear about this. And Hatha yeah. yoga is not the same as... Uh, Yoga is really old, of course. It's it's very old, five thousand years old, of course. But Hatha Yoga is these all these postures, you know. And and Patanjali talked only about one posture, which which is meditation posture, mm-hmm. and then all these other postures came later. Mm-hmm. And that's what I meant. Uh, right, right, so, right. Something different right. evolved much mm-hmm. later. But you know, to 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 be able to sit still, you know, people do these exercises to to re- release the tensions in the body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, thank you, thank you. All right, we need to wind up. We've only got a couple of minutes, so but thanks for mentioning those things in the chat. Rig Veda of five thousand years ago. Not sure because I haven't read it. Um, probably. I mean, in Ayurveda, it's a part of. I don't know if they. T- it is a part of the Ayurvedic centers, I'm sure, and that's five thousand years. And then what was the other one? By say. Vaisesika Sutta. So you'll be able to just look that up online. Okay, so we're almost out. So, Manoi, would you like to? Yeah, I was so interested in this little research. It was quite quite interesting topic that Susan, you know, brought up. And and thank you very much, Anda and Venerable Upeka, both for 
these wonderful discussions and it's not uh, sitting and listening. It's a, it's a very active discussion and it provokes the thoughts as well. So thank you very much for giving this opportunity for all of us and thank you for everybody who is participating in this um, and making it alive and relevant. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, just a little bit of an update on the on the monastery. And uh, yes, it is. It, there's a lot of things happening there to improve the house to the monastery still. And uh, the big thing is that, that we still have to sell the previous Vihara and um, then only we can, you know, settle our loans that we bought this uh, monastery. So that is the big concern and uh, uh, that where we put our energies into. Um, and um, uh, also, you know, that today's the discussion and all these teachings, regular teachings are offered on a donation basis in the spirit of generosity. And with your donations, we do all these things, regular teachings and other Venerable Chandas, um, outside teachings and so many other things, as well as giving, you know, building up this place for the future and the present and uh, for the bikunis to um, uh, come and, you know, uh, uh, for the women to come and become bikunis as well for the lay people to go and experience the difference from the uh, day-to-day life. Um, and uh, it gives the community as well as a wider world valuable Dhamma talks, teachings, and uh, uh, ability to arrange meditation retreats um, as well. And uh, we're talking about the meditation retreats. Um, have a look at our events page. There is um, Ajahn Brahmali is coming, and uh, then Ajahn Brahm is having an online retreat, and there is um, Venerable Chanda's uh, teachings as well. So please have a look at the events page. Um, the best thing is to uh, subscribe to the newsletter so you will get all these regular news and the links how to do, you know, how to get into different pages will be there. But if you want to get involved in different ways, like giving a dana or um, giving any other, uh, doing volunteering, please contact the team at anukampaproject.org. But I think what we need at this point is the monetary donations as well uh, because although we got the monastery as i said we still have to um, you know settle our finances and improve the monastery and do all the regular regular things so um are we we very much um uh, welcome uh, Joe, any, any amount of donation very gratefully. And with those donations, we do all these um, wonderful things uh, that Anukampa Bikuni project is doing and uh, we'll be growing uh, from here as well. And uh, we like standing orders, particularly they're helpful to keep the normal, um, you know, workflow uh, as well. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for you know being part of this community. <laughs> thank you, Manoi. Uh, yeah, I'm sure there was something else I wanted to share, but probably that is good for now. So yeah, I think uh, we've probably mentioned all the retreats that are coming up. Anything else? What's happening? That's it, no? That's it. Yeah. Here, I think. Yep. Very good. Days. All right. Yes, but most people aren't English, so yeah, <laughs> you're probably not coming for that. <laughs> okay, so take care. And tomorrow it's Saturday. How about a meta session? Is there a meta session tomorrow? I can check, but it should be, I think. Is there? Yes, meta meditation tomorrow morning. Um, and then we'll see you on Wednesday, I guess, for the chanting. Okay. All right. Take care, everybody. If you wish to wave goodbye, please uh, do so. We can stop the recording.